God is so good. I'm excited to, uh, to uh, minister, to teach and preach this word this morning. Uh, how many of you have already uh, experienced just the presence of God and, and maybe hopefully a profound way? Just a profound way. God profoundly wants to touch us. He wants to, he wants to take some of the things. How many of you realize that when you came in, man, you had the weight of the world? Some, uh, uh, seriously, there's stuff going on. You might have some health stuff, some relational stuff, financial stuff. I mean, just like, man, there's just stuff we bring in in the presence of God. That stuff sometimes doesn't change, but the way that we look at it changes and the way that we're able to carry it. Because you know what? We don't have to carry it. We give it to Him. We give it to Him. And I I hope you've experienced that dynamic presence of God this morning because I'm going to be talking about the presence of God this morning. And how many of you recognize that when you come into a room that just by your presence, you can change things? Amen. Amen. Somebody comes in, you recognize them. It's like, oh, wow, it's different because you're here. How many of you recognize that when somebody, you know, you, you gather together. I do this all the time for church. You gather together and you recognize that somebody's not there. And you just go, oh, man, there's like a hole right there where they usually would be. You know, I mean, somebody usually sits by you and I can feel that because there's a presence that we have. Well, what about the presence of God? So the presence of God, I want to talk to you this morning. I'm going to open up with a word of prayer if you'll bow your heads and your hearts with me. Jesus, thank you so much for the encounter that you want to have today with your people. God, there are people here this morning that are desperate for that encounter. They need that encounter. And so, God, I just ask that this morning as we come together, you help me to teach, you help me to communicate. Uh, I pray that you would inspire us today. You would inspire. There's something in that word, uh, Lord, that inspire that has to do with breath. And I pray that, God, you would inspire us today. You would breathe something in us today that would be transformational, would be life-changing. In your name, God, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. It says, now Moses, most of you know who Moses was, right? Moses? Okay, Moses. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. And so he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. And then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. And so when the Lord saw that he had turned aside to look, God called him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. So I want to take this morning and I want to, I want to, in our foundations and, and pillar series that we've been doing to teach and unpack some truths about the presence of God, the presence of God, not the presence of God, but the presence of God. And the presence of God is not just some influence. But, it, but, but, but he abides and he dwells in and among us. And the above passage speaks of the first encounter that Moses had with the presence of God, with the manifest presence of God, and it was life-altering. See, that's what the presence of God can do. That's what an encounter with God can do. It can be life-altering. And I believe that that's the desire of God. And and it was not only life-changing for Moses, but it affected and impacted his family and all the nations of the earth. That one encounter in the desert impacted generation. It impacted, it touched our history. There's something about this that we have to get a hold. See, the presence of God is a life-changer and it's a people-changer. It will change you forever. Moses went from being a prince to a pauper in his own strength. And then out in the desert... With one encounter with God, he was, he was actually set back upon this path of destiny and purpose that he had. You know, I see that happen in the lives of people where, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a destiny, there's a purpose, there's something, and then we get just delayed and distracted. I'm actually going to probably preach two or three messages on the presence of God and talk about that. But there are different levels of God's presence that we find biblically much like there would be different levels or expressions of our presence. You've heard me teach this before. An example would be uh, used to communicate with somebody via email or text or in person. How many of you recognize in person has a greater impact? And so we see the the sovereignty of God. We see the omnipresence of God. And we see the manifest presence of God. And Moses' encounter would be the manifest, which basically simply means the open showing of God's presence. 
So the manifest presence of God appeared to, uh, to, to, to Moses. There's difference. It's different from the omnipresence, which is described biblically as well. One example of an om- the omnipresence of God would be in Jeremiah 23 and 24, where Jeremiah says, Can a man hide himself in hiding places so I don't see him? declares the Lord. Do I not fill the heavens and the earth? declares the Lord. Listen, you, you can run, but you can't hide. I mean, seriously, this is crazy. But a burning bush experience represents the, 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 the power of the manifest presence of God. And that presence is something that we all need. And Moses turning represents a decision to make the presence of God a priority, to make it a priority. We find later in the story of Moses that he had a face-to-face encounter with God and, and, and Moses made this condition with God. I'm going to read that passage and then we're going to kind of look at it. Because to me, it's like, it's pretty cool. It, it shows the relationship back and forth between Moses and God, which was just phenomenal. I mean, Moses was, was not afraid. He had the kind of relationship where he could kind of bargain with God a little bit. So let's look at this passage in Exodus 33, 13 through 16. Moses is praying. He starts out. He says, now, therefore, I pray... If I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way that I may know you and I might find grace in your sight. And consider this nation is your people. And then you see where the Lord answers him. And he said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And then he said to him, now this is Moses back to God. He said, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. For how will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight, except that you go with us? So we, so we shall be separate, your people and I, from all the people who are upon the face of the earth. So Moses recognized that the mark of being God's people would be God's presence. See, religion has mistaken outward appearances for the mark of God's presence. Now, it doesn't mean that it won't be affected. But religion has said, if you look good from top to bottom, then you, you're okay. Religion is actually mistaken the mark of God's people for behavior. But walking with God is more than behavior modification. Has my behavior been modified? Absolutely. There's stuff I've had to lay aside. There's stuff I've, had, uh, I've been delivered from, et cetera, et cetera. But that's not the mark. That's a, that's one of the fruits of being God's people. But the mark of God's people has always been the desire of God to be the presence of God. And that's what I want you to really get a hold of this morning. Think about our definition of success. Think about the definition of a successful business person. It would be the bottom line, profit loss, right? Think about the success of an athlete. An athlete's measure of success would be wins and losses. But think about the success of the church. What should be the the success of the church? It is marked with the presence of God. It's marked with the presence of God. Our desire, and I believe this is God's desire, is when people come into this corporate gathering of God's people, that they sense the tangible, manifest presence of God. That there's something that's different. Because how many of you recognize there's, there's a lot of buildings that are a lot more beautiful? There's a lot more things that, that, that we could look at in the trappings and say, yeah, that's really cool. It's not about the building. It's not about the, 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 even the, the, the worship, the, how we present things. It's about the presence of God. It has to be partnered together with the Spirit of God. And so when we, when we look at this, If God's presence abides, dwells, guides, empowers, and inspires us, which it does, and much more, why would we not want to pursue it, cultivate it, make sure it has the most important place in our life? I'm going to push you a little bit this morning because what I've recognized is that many times we, we forget or we diminish or we take for granted just the presence of God. And I believe that there's something about pursuing it. Every relationship has an aspect or a need to, to pursue something. It's like if you, if you want to be, like the Bible says that uh, if a man 
uh, is friendly, he will have friends. Must show himself to be friendly. So there's something there where it says, listen, I've talked to people who said, well, I don't have any friendships. Well, then show yourself to be friendly. So there's a, there's a give and take to every relationship. There's people that are acquaintances, and there's, oh, I've heard about that people. And, and Jesus had the same thing. He had the 5,000. He had the, the 4,000. He had people that just wanted to come for the, for the fish and loaves. And then he had the 120. He had the 70. He had the, the 12. He had the three, and ultimately the one who loved him. So there's different levels of relationship that we all walk in. Can I get an amen? This relationship that we have with God, it can be, well, yeah, I know about God. And I, I, I read the Bible every once in a while. I go to church, you know, maybe once every once in a while. But, I, but I'm telling you what, if, if I was to apply that to my relationship in my marriage or with my children, it wouldn't be, it'd be a pretty shallow relationship. Can I get an amen? amen? So there's something that God wants us to do that I believe that we see modeled in Scripture. It's life-changing, life-altering, as making sure the presence of God is the most important thing in our life, and we go after it. There's a passion within us. The Hebrew word translated most presence, 76 times actually, has this root meaning and, and to turn the face, turn towards someone in an accepting or favorable manner. The most powerful life-changing influence in our walk is the presence of God. Sadly, we overlook the importance of it too often. Tommy Tenney from the book God Chasers wrote this. He said, I'm tired of reading about God's visitations of yesteryear. I want God to break out somewhere in my lifetime so that in the future my children can say, I was there, I know it's true. God has no grandchildren. Each generation must experience His presence. Uh, recitation, listen, recitation was never meant to take the place of visitation. We need a move of God. And we need to be people who chase the presence of God. Court the presence of God. Ask for the presence of God. Pray for the presence of God. Value the presence of God. We know we need the presence of God. We've seen the presence of God and how it's impacted people. And we go, oh, that's good for them. They probably really needed that. It's like, no, man, we need it. We need it. Our, our, our marriages need it. Our families need it. Our children need it. Our grandchildren needs it. Our, our neighbors need it. Our nation needs it. Our nation needs a, a visitation and a powerful uh, showing of God's presence. And you know, here's the thing. He wants to do it through you. He wants to do it through me. God's presence was of paramount importance to King David. He said in Psalm 51.11, Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. In Psalm 68, verse 8, it says, the earth quaked. The heavens also dropped rain at the presence of God. Sinai itself quaked at the presence of God, the God of Israel. Man, that's just powerful stuff. In Proverbs 7.15, it says, Therefore I have come out to meet you, to seek your presence earnestly, and I have found you. There's a story in John chapter 6 where the disciples as well as 5,000 hungry people were in the presence of Jesus. In John 6, 5-6, it says, Then Jesus lifted up His eyes and seeing a great multitude coming toward Him, He said, Philip, where shall we buy bread that all these may eat? <laughs> Can you think? I mean, there's the heart of God. He's seeing 5,000 people and He goes, they're coming and they're hungry. Gary, get the skillet going. Right? I, I, I mean, he was, he was like, we, but the disciples, can you imagine when Jesus said that? Because he said, he said this to test them, for he himself knew what he would do. So Jesus took the loaves and the fish and he multiplied them. Things happen in the presence of God that don't happen when you're not in the presence of God. God takes uh, uh, incredible uh, circumstances and makes them opportunities for Him to move. God takes small resources and enlarges them in His presence. 
We, we can't get over this. In fact, if we could really grasp how important it is to be in the presence of God, stay in the presence of God, court the presence of God, because we see all of these aspects that he's capable of doing and we pursue him, it would be amazing. Your life would be surrounded by miracles. I truly believe that. Boy, somebody ought to get way more excited than that. You need to be more excited than I am. You know what I'm saying? So there, we were at this recent conference uh, last week and we were challenged about the Acts 2 church and the visitation of God's presence in the upper room. I want to read that passage of Scripture to you. In Acts 1, uh, verses 12 through 13, it says, Then they return to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey. And when they had entered, they went into the upper room. Somebody say, upper room. They went into the upper room where they were staying. Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. See, I've been thinking and praying about that since. It represents a spiritual truth that we need to get into our spirit. I want to I revisit a story in 2 Kings. In 2 Kings uh, chapter 4, verses 8 through 10, it says that one day Elisha went to Shunem, where a wealthy woman lived who urged him to eat some food. So whenever he passed that way, he would turn in there to eat food. I think probably the food is pretty good. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I'm just picking this up. It says where a wealthy woman lived who urged him to eat some food. I'm, not, I'm pretty sure it's not just hot dogs. Because he turned in there. It's like, man, I went there before. Oh, man, that was good food. I'm going back. I'm going to check that place out again. In fact, I'm going to make that a part of my regular routine right? I'm going to make that part of my regular routine because you know what? She's serving some down home, awesome sauce stuff. So I'm going to keep turning in there. I mean, it's just like he goes by and he goes, Oh yeah. Oh, I can smell. You ever walked by somebody's place like the neighbors I'm outside and one of my neighbors is barbecuing. I want to become close friends in that moment. It's like, I don't know about you. I don't know even what my wife is cooking, but I'm telling you what, what's coming over the fence is cooking. It smells good. So here is Elisha, and he's walking, and he, and he basically he, he, he makes a regular habit. But see, what happens is this woman recognizes this. Elisha represents the presence of God. He represents the man of God. And she's going, hey, when he's coming here, He's eating some food, but we need to make a place for him. We need to make a consistent place for him. So I'm going to finish the story. And she said to her husband, Behold, now I know that this is a holy man of God who's continually passing our way, so let's make a small room. Let's, let's transform your shop. Wait a minute. <laughs> I'm not sensing that's God at all. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but she says, let's make a small room on the roof with walls and put there for him a bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp. So whenever he comes to us, he can go in there. So Elisha is the man of God here. And the story represents a woman who made room for the things of God. She made room. She courted the presence of God. She made room for him. And not just any room. She did not remodel a closet or a basement or your husband's shop. She made an upper room on the roof. That's what the passage says. It speaks of a prominent place. It speaks of a place that would change how the house looked. Have you ever, like been in a, uh, I mean, we, we've got like trees around us and we don't have super close neighbors, but we've lived before in like a close neighborhood. And you recognize when somebody's doing a remodel and you're thinking, okay, wow, they're putting a porch on her and they're adding a room on her, whatever. So she made a prominent place. A place that would change how the house looked. Something I believe that even the neighbors would be aware of. What is she doing making a place on the roof? Because I want something in my life that's prominent. That's basically going to help me pursue God. The presence of God is so important. The room that we make for God in our lives, in our homes, in our marriages should not be something that's tucked away or hidden. 
but something that absolutely changes the appearance of these things in our life. See, God wants room in our lives that's strategic, thought out, and changes things. Are you creating room in your life for the presence of God? I've got a couple special rooms in, in my house that are a reflection of me. You know, if you go downstairs, there's a you know, there's pictures of bird dogs and, you know, there's a, there's a gun up on the wall and, and then there's a, you know, a little studio room down there. There's lots of musical instruments and guitars. I mean, when you walk down there, it reflects really who I am. My bathroom is different than my wife's bathroom. My bathroom don't reflect who she is. I had to walk into her. We had some guests and we usually kind of give up my bathroom when we have guests and I had to use her bathroom you know, recently, and it's like, man, oh man, it looks so different than mine. There's stuff hanging on the wall, and there's like, I mean, I, seriously, it's crazy. I feel like I need to build a new house with just a big, you know, big Mondo bathroom just for her, for all her stuff. She likes that stuff. She just said, amen. <laughs> Dr. Uh, Frank DiMaggio, I heard him say this. He said, the upper room is one that is above all other rooms. Is there an upper room in your lifestyle? Is there an upper room in your calendar? Can you pull your calendar out and go, boom, there's the prominent place. There's the prominent place where I'm making a place for the presence of God to meet with God. Oh, it's getting really quiet in here now. Is there an upper room in your week? Is there a place in our busy lifestyle where we're saying, I'm setting aside this right now. It's going to be prominent. It's going to be consistent. It's going to change the appearance of my family. But I'm setting aside a room, a a room for God in my week that I'm going to court His presence. Do you make room for prayer, for reading Scripture? Do you make room? Have you made room for worship in your life? It's like, man, I I just need the presence of God. I need God's presence. Do you make room for gathering together with God's people and expecting the presence of God to be transformational? Or do you just come to fill some kind of a duty? Once again, religion has said the mark of God's people is your appearance. Religion says the mark of God's people is your behavior. Those are all going to be affected, but that's not the point. The mark of of God's people is the presence of God. That's why Moses was saying, hey, listen, I know you have a great plan for my life and a great plan for these people, but don't lead me out unless you're going to be with me. Because that's the difference. That's the difference in our life. Is that manifest, that presence of God. Wherever you create room for God, God will influence If there's room in my time, God will influence my time. If there's room in my finances, God will influence my finances. And a lot of times we we, we tend to compartmentalize. That's your bathroom. This is mine. I'm okay, God, with making room in my time. That's cool. That's great. I'm okay uh, making room in my week, but... Leave my finances alone. Can I, can I just kind of, can I just oversee my finances, God? Can I, can I, can I, can I oversee it? How's that been working for you? (laughs) Wherever you make room, God, you make room in your relationship. You make room in your marriage for God. You know, there were some amazing statistics, uh, a few years back from the Billy Graham Association. And they said that basically out in the world where divorce rate is about 50%, but they said if you, if you take a couple and they, they, they begin to, to, to attend church consistently, now it's only, instead of one out of every two, now it's only one in 25 get a divorce. And then they said, now, if you take that same couple and basically they begin to pray together, you're, they're making room in their relation. They're praying together. One in 500. You make room for God in any area of your life and he will influence it. You make room for God in, in how you relate to your children. He's going he's gonna to influence it. 
And when you create a special room, how many of you ever created a special room? I'm telling you what, man, there's finances involved. My wife starts decorating a room, and guess what she says? Hey, hey, what's my budget? I'm thinking, budget? Just kind of move the furniture around a little bit. You know, hang that picture that hasn't been hung for years downstairs up there. It's all fresh, right? No, uh no, uh How many of you can relate with me? When you create a special room, there are purposes involved. You know, you know what? Okay, I want this room to be, this is my music room. And I, I, I want there to be like pictures of music stuff. There's a, you know, there's a, you know, there's, there's instruments and there's, 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 you know, all kinds of stuff like that. You know what the purpose is. What is the purpose that you're making room for? And there's time involved. Can I say this? Your life will never be fulfilled and content if you are at the center of it. God's presence. We're created to have the presence of God at the center of our lives, and sometimes a room gets cluttered. Have you ever had that room that gets cluttered? I mean, you said that, that's my sewing room. Right? Okay, I'm going to talk to the ladies right now. My grandma was an amazing seamstress. That's my sewing room. And then, you know, if you're not careful, pretty soon you're putting other stuff. And guess what? That sewing room just became storage room. How about that room that we make for the presence of God in our life? What's cluttered it up? As it becomes just a storage room, what needs to be removed from your upper room? You know, there's two things that are really important whenever you preach. I think every pastor, every preacher, teacher needs to ask this. What do I want them to know? And what do I want them to do? And I'm telling you, here's what I want you to know. Your life is designed to be a pursuer of the presence of God. There will be no, you know, no contentment, no fulfillment unless you grasp a hold of that reality. That's what I want you to know. You know what I want you to do? I want you to go for it. I want you to go for it. I want you to basically allow the Lord to just show you, hey, there's some clutter in here. You've kind of turned that room out. Or maybe you've never created that room at all in your life. And, and Moses had an encounter with God that changed his life and changed many others. There's an encounter possible this morning if you don't know the Lord as uh, Jesus as Lord and Savior. But there's something that I just, I just want to move us into this morning. If I could have a couple of musicians. I want to invite you to a life-changing encounter this morning. I want to invite you to a life-changing encounter. By, 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 by recognizing, we're going to just take a little bit of time. Uh, I, I, we're going we're gonna to kind of, we're going to finish up our service a little bit different than what we have. I've just been kind of praying about this and pouring over this. And I just believe that we need to take a step and we need to say, God, I need to create some room in my life. Or I need to unclutter some of the stuff in my life that's been keeping me from pursuing your presence. Paul writes this. He said, he said, uh, you know, basically cast off those things. We uh, cast off the sin that we're so easily entangled with. And you have this incredible picture of a runner that's getting ready to go. And some of us have become burdened down by, by a lot of things that basically God never intended for our life. I believe we're called to be pursuers of God. Because when you pursue God and the, and the desire of God is that you would, you would encounter His presence. Moses had to make a decision to turn. And when he turned, his life was changed. The life of a nation was changed. Our lives were changed because one man. What could it impact if one person here would turn? Turn into the presence of God. Turn into the presence of God. Make room for the presence of God. Do you have an upper room that's created in your life, in your time, in your calendar, in your finances, in your commitments, in your priorities? Lifestyle of pursuing and welcome, welcoming the presence of God is the, is the walk of a believer. Would you just bow your heads and your hearts with me?